Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. Per listener request, I will be producing a few more non-interpretive skills episodes. I have found that these are generally very popular episodes for listeners preparing for radiology board exams. This episode will focus on reimbursement and regulatory compliance, as outlined in the 2021 American Board of Radiology Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide in Chapter 5, specifically Section 5.1.1, titled Coding, Billing, and Reimbursement. I will make a free downloadable study guide on this topic available on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com, so please check that out if that is helpful for you. Also, please follow at Radrev Podcast on Twitter or Instagram, where I post things like tips for the physics portion of radiology board exams. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what is a current procedural terminology code? That is also abbreviated CPT code. What is a CPT code? A CPT code is a unique code that identifies a specific physician service for payment. CPT codes are developed and maintained by the American Medical Association CPT Editorial Panel. Next question. What is the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, which is abbreviated RBRVS, as well as the RBRVS Update Committee, which is abbreviated RUC, and the Relative Value Unit? To repeat again, the question is, what is the RBRVS, Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, RUC, which is short for the RBRVS Update Committee, and RVU, which is short for Relative Value Unit? All right, let's get into this. The RBRVS which is the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, is the methodology used by the AMA RUC Committee, which RUC stands for the RBRVS Update Committee. And the RUC uses the RBRVS to assign RVUs, which is a relative value unit, to a CPT code. That is a ton of abbreviations, and unfortunately, I do, in reality, think you need to know these. This is specifically discussed in the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, and I would encourage you to download the study guide for this episode on my own website to review this yourself, as well as refer to the ABR NIS study guide. Let me say the answer to this question one more time. The RBRVS is the methodology used by the AMA RUC to assign RVUs to CPT codes. This is essentially the methodology, which is the RBRVS, the committee, which is the RUC, and the resulting reimbursement value, which is the RVU, that is attached to each CPT code to determine how much the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is also abbreviated CMS, will pay for each medical service. And that brings us to the next question. What factors are considered by the RUC, again that is RUC, when determining a RVU for each CPT code? Per the ABR NIS study guide, RVUs, which are relative value units, are supposed to reflect the work RVU, which is the time, intensity, effort, and skill required to accomplish a physician service, as well as the practice expense RVU, 
which is the costs of practice maintenance, including non-physician staff, supplies, equipment, and finally, the malpractice RVU, which is the cost of professional liability expenses. So the RVU principally has three components, broken down as the work RVU, the practice expense RVU, and the malpractice RVU. Additionally, there are geographic cost adjustments put into an annual conversion factor that determines the final CMS payments that are listed in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. What that means is that the RUC assigns RVUs with consideration for work RVUs, practice expense RVUs, and malpractice RVUs, and then that final RVU value that is determined is multiplied by a conversion factor that applies a geographic cost adjustment into the final payment that is finally published in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Note that the work RVU is often used as a metric of physician productivity. So if you hear something like, Partners in a specific practice are expected to have a certain amount of RVUs per year. They are typically referring to the work RVUs that a physician generates. Technically, the ABR NIS study guide says that CMS assigns RVUs to services on an independent basis, but again, according to the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, the AMA RUC recommendations, and that is RUC, the committee that determines these, those AMA RUC recommendations are accepted by CMS in more than 90% of cases. Next question. Per the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, CMS and private insurers generally pay only for services deemed medically necessary. What is the CMS definition for medical necessity? According to the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, the definition of medical necessity used by CMS is healthcare services or supplies needed to prevent, diagnose, or treat an illness, injury, condition, disease, or its symptoms, and that meet accepted standards of medicine. Medical necessity is determined at the time a claim is submitted to a payer, and part of this determination is ensuring that a CPT service code matches a pre-approved diagnosis code list. Let's move on to the next question. What is the International Classification of Diseases System, which is abbreviated ICD, and who establishes this system? The ICD system is established by the World Health Organization and comprises the diagnosis codes for which a CPT service code must match in order to determine medical necessity. The current version of ICD is ICD-10. ICD codes describe the signs, symptoms, or specific diagnosis of a patient that then form the indication for a healthcare service or CPT code. The ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide specifically points out that in documentation, terms such as rule out or consistent with are not sufficient to assign an ICD-10 code and do not meet medical necessity criteria. Therefore, for radiology services, a symptom such as chest pain may be appropriate to attach an ICD code, but rule-out pneumonia would not be appropriate as justification to assign an ICD code. My summary of CPD and ICD codes for a radiologist is as follows. CPT codes identify the physician's service performed, such as performing and interpreting an X-ray or CT scan. ICD codes identify the patient's sign, symptom, or diagnosis that justifies the service identified by the CPT code. Next question. 
How are ICD-10 and CPT codes actually assigned for a given radiology service? And what I mean by this question is how at your institution or practice are ICD-10 and CPD codes likely to be assigned for a given radiology service that you may perform? The primary answer here is that professional coders with the aid of software tools, evaluate documentation in healthcare records and physician reports to extract information to assign ICD-10 and CPT codes. These professional coders must be credentialed by the Radiology Coding Certification Board. Coders principally use statements about exam indications and clinical history from the referring physician and or patient and diagnostic information from the findings or best case from the impression of the radiology report to assign appropriate ICD-10 codes. To assign CPT codes, coders look at specific details of the described service and this often would be found in the technique section of a radiology report. Next question. What are some factors from radiology services that are considered when assigning complexity for CPT codes? Not all CPT codes are the same, and the more complex an exam, the higher complexity can be assigned to a CPT code. A similar service, such as a CT scan, will have different CPT coding based on the complexity of an exam, and the higher complexity exam can be assigned a higher complexity CPT code. Again, the more complex an exam, the higher the complexity that can be assigned to a CPT code. The rationale is that some services are more complex than others. For example, some x-rays may have many more views that need to be performed and interpreted compared to other x-ray exams, and some ultrasound studies evaluate more organs and structures and features than other ultrasound studies. Therefore, reimbursement may vary between these services. The ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide states that for x-rays, more views generally mean higher complexity codes. For ultrasound, inventory checklists exist that determine complexity. For CT and MRI, details of contrast administration determine the CPT complexity code level for a specific body part. The ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide states that structured template reporting helps radiologists comply with many of these reporting requirements to aid appropriate reimbursement and regulatory compliance. Next question. What are radiology benefit management companies? And these are abbreviated RBM. According to the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, many private payers, Medicaid plans, and Medicare Advantage plans contract with RBM companies, again, that is a radiology benefit management company, and require pre-authorization, which is also sometimes termed pre-certification, as a condition for reimbursement of elective outpatient advanced imaging services. This pre-authorization is something that may be required to obtain before performing advanced imaging services, which may include CT, MRI, and PET-CT scans. The ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide states that radiology facilities should determine whether pre-authorization is required for a specific service for a specific patient, and, if preauthorization is required, whether this preauthorization has been obtained. Furthermore, the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide states that although a necessary condition for payment, obtaining preauthorization by an RBM does not necessarily guarantee that medical necessity will be determined by the insurer when the claim is filed. Importantly, you should know that preauthorization requirements generally do not apply to inpatient and emergency department services. 
Next question. What is the False Claim Act and how can radiology practices be compliant with the False Claim Act, which is also abbreviated FCA, False Claim Act? The False Claim Act protects the government from being overcharged or sold substandard goods or services. Basically, a false claim refers to fraudulent claims wherein payment is requested for services that a provider knew were false or fraudulent. The U.S. Department of Justice expects physicians and radiology practices to have processes, structures, and cultures oriented toward integrity of revenue cycle operations and billing. The best practice is to have a formal compliance plan with a formally appointed compliance officer and compliance committee to oversee revenue operations and to stay within the bounds set by the False Claim Act when submitting services to the government for reimbursement. Last question for this episode. What are penalties that can be enacted for not complying with the False Claim Act? Penalties from a false claim ruling can include, according to the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, fines up to three times the billed amount plus $11,000 per claim filed. Note that a single exam or service billed to Medicare or Medicaid counts as a single claim. The ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide states that to date, the largest settlement agreement by a radiology practice for being in violation of the FCA is $7 million U.S. dollars. That's enough for now. I hope this episode was helpful for you. Remember to download the free study guide on this topic that is available on my website for free download, www.theradiologyreview.com. I also refer you to the most current version of the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. This episode was made on the 2021 ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide, which is the most current version as of this podcast episode. However, if you are listening to this episode in future years, make sure to refer to the current version of the ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment. 